thanks very much for uh, for joining our insider series uh, session today. We have Chris Colbert. Chris Colbert is an experienced uh, business coach. Today, he's going to talk about the six pillars of uh, persuasion. And with this, I pass it on to Chris. We'll have a Q and A at the end. If you do have questions in the meantime, please keep sending them through on the on the chat box, and uh, we, we'll take them. Thanks, Chris. On to, uh, on to you. Thanks, Josh. And welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I really, uh, throughout my sales career, have looked for opportunities or, or some interesting learnings that I'm able to take away and practically implement in my business. Um, I also like them to be nice and memorable. And I, I really found myself attached over the years to the Six Pillars of Persuasion by uh, Dr. Cialdini. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always a big fan of borrowing from other people. So I, I don't claim to have entered any of these things myself. Um, and what I really love about what uh, Dr. Cialdini did is with these six pillars of persuasion is really connect to some important ways that we're able to influence, or as it, as it says, persuade people to move in our direction. And it's, it's interesting in that uh, really, if we want to define what, what sales is or what sales is about, for me, it's really about moving people's belief system. In most cases, when we reach out or connect with a, a prospect or a client to provide our services or products or whatever the case may be, our widgets, then we're really looking to move them from a position where at the moment, before they meet us, they believe they've got the best approach to whatever their, their challenge may be. Managing their business and, and in the case of Valenta, it could be how they're, they're currently staffing their business. It could be their processes and how they currently go about them. And at the moment, they believe that that's the, the best approach to take. And what we're doing as an outsider is coming in and introducing ourselves and really saying, you know, what we'd like you to do is, is change that belief. We want to move you more towards the idea that we've got a better system and approach where we can deliver a, a more optimised solution for your business. And so it's this persuasion of moving from one belief to another. What we want is we want clients who believe what we believe. And so persuasion is very important. That's what we're, we're looking to do is really use the tools available to us to open up the eyes of our and have a great look at our product and service. And so there's some, some great strategies in here to leverage psychology to help use and, and move people in our direction or towards our position in that regard. And that's what I'd like to take you through today. So the six pillars of persuasion, there's probably a, a couple of others in there, but I'll, I'll try and uh, have them make sense for you and, and how we can apply these in our, in our daily business. And I, uh, as well as doing training and mentoring around business growth and sales, um, my wife and I also own a wholesale herb and spice business. Um, and that business is, was last year grew 60%. And all of the strategies or, or the pillars of persuasion that we're gonna talk about today, I use on a daily basis within my business and prove to be very successful in our business growth uh, in a completely different industry. So. I do know that they work and I use them on a daily basis in a very practical way. So uh, I'm a big fan of them. So the first one, the first pillar of persuasion that I talk about is reciprocity. Um, and reciprocity is, is really this idea of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it's persuasive because when we uh, offer something to somebody effectively free of charge, we're, we're looking to give somebody something there's actually a built-in indebtedness that occurs with that, that uh, situation. So it can be, reciprocity can be as simple as uh, sampling, for example. Um, if I walk through a supermarket and somebody is, is sampling some uh, product in that supermarket and you'll try it, you'll be amazed at the number of people that will bend down and pick up whatever that may be and pop it in their, their supermarket trolley. Or if you're walking up the street and somebody's sampling some falafels on the street, you end up going in and buying some falafel. Um, it's, it, it's just a very clear and easy way to look at reciprocity, this idea I'm going to give you something without an automatic expectation of something in return. But in fact, what happens psychologically is we do feel a small indebtedness. And this can occur, that's an example of, of a product per se, but it can happen in other ways. You, you've heard of things like a puppy dog sale, where we might leave a product with somebody to trial it, and they find that they, uh, they enjoy it. And again, there's this indebtedness of, well, I'll, I'll keep it then. Um, often in consulting and in the professional services space, it can seem a little more difficult to go, well, what's that reciprocity look like? But for somebody in a position in consulting like uh, Valenta, often our expertise is what, what we can share without any expectation of something immediately in return. 
So when we reach out to the marketplace, and there's several points in the process where this applies, particularly when we're looking to go out to the marketplace and, and develop opportunities or get meetings with clients. Offering that, that knowledge and that expertise to the market and, and sharing that knowledge is a way of leveraging reciprocity. There's a lot of information, for example, at Valenta BPO around RPA, IPA, um, around outsourcing and what's con contemporary strategy in each of those regards is a level of expertise that our clients probably don't have. And by offering that and putting it out there to say, look, let us share this information with you without an expectation of any immediate return, what happens is, is we've created that indebtedness. It, it's built that sense of um, you giving me something of value without expecting return and and as i say the psychology tells us that what will actually happen is that small set of indebtedness so it might mean that you then get to ask for a meeting or that you get to ask for the next step in the process whatever that may be so look for opportunities in your business to share to, to share knowledge and and to really build a knowledge base which you can reach out to the market and, and provide without um, losing the value of your offering without giving away everything that is your business but what you're really doing is is sharing that knowledge and giving somebody something. And, and that becomes quite powerful in building relationships and persuading people. So find ways to, to give things to your client that create that indebtedness. The next in the pillars are the three C's. And, and I find probably my favorite here or the thing that I use most is consensus. Um, but I wanna talk through each of these. Um, they're really important, in fact, um, you'll find at certain stages of the process that they're essential. Um, and I might start on the right with, with consensus to give you an example. Um, in our first meeting, once we have the chance and we've been lucky enough to secure an appointment with a decision maker, if we're out growing our business, what we want to ensure right through the, the process from that point forward is that we get consensus with the decision maker on where we stand in that process and, and whether we've got agreement and that would take the form of, you know, doing a needs analysis, for example. It's really important as I go through the conversation that I'm consistently checking in with the client that I understand what their challenges are. They might be describing, for example, in the case of Valenta, they might be describing their current processes and systems to me. It's really important that I'm consistently doubling back and just getting consensus that we both agree on what that challenge is, that they've shared that with me and that I understand it. Um, and not only do I understand it, but I've articulated that and the decision maker and I both agree that that challenge exists and, and that we both believe it is caused by the same thing. And I do that on a regular basis throughout my meetings with the client. I keep checking in, I keep getting consensus. It sounds like this is a challenge, is that correct? Yeah. It sounds like that's caused some problems in the business, is that correct? Yes. This, this constant checkpoint also reinforces for the customer because what they're doing is going through a, a process of self-awareness and discovery as you, as you talk through the needs of their business. They're going through some self-discovery. And what happens is, is it's very hard for, for a client who then describes that, that situation or that challenge in their business to agree with you that that is a challenge. And then at some point further down the track, reverse that decision or change that. What happens is when we get these small commitments and we get consensus, we've kind of got a marker in the ground that we can look to and we can all, all agree on. And, and there's no backing out of that. We've got real clarity and it's very important. Often we can have a, a sales process or we can go through you know, our first meetings and have a conversation about things. But if we, if we just kind of make our notes and continue on without getting that consensus, we lack some power in that because it's very easy down the track for prospects. To go, well, no, you kind of misunderstood that or no, that's not really how I felt because we never really put a pin in it and really said, okay, underline it, dot the I's and cross the T's, that's our position. And that's what consensus does for us. So we've got this wonderful cross check occurring throughout the process. Um, it also gives us a great opportunity at the end, for example, of the first meeting, it would be a case of saying, look, I, I believe there's a great opportunity for us to work here together. Would you agree? And I'm going to clearly just get a yes or a no. Um, and, and it's not necessarily asking for the business or asking to sign a contract at a given point in time. It might be just that. I just We agree that the opportunity exists to take the next step. And at the end of the first meeting, I would always be doing that. If I'm looking to put in a proposal, I want the, 
the prospect or the client to agree that they'd like to see a proposal, for example. It's not just that I want to give you one, you've agreed that you would like to get one. And so it just changes the dynamic for us in how we continue to move forward. Consensus really does mean we're doing it together. We, we eliminate the chance that I'm off on one path thinking, oh, this is going very well and I'm going to give you a proposal. And the prospect's actually on a very different path thinking, well, this isn't really for me. As soon as we get consensus, we immediately bring those two things back together. We bring ourselves in, into alignment with the, with the prospect. One way or not, at least we've got consensus and we agree. And that's how we tie into commitments in a way. The great thing about getting these little commitments is, is the same thing. Once we've made a decision, we tend to stick with it. The psychology of human beings is that once we've made that decision, it's very hard for us or unlikely that we will unwind that decision. It, it can happen, but it's not likely. And so for me, the way that I use this would, would again be in this, this process, in the sales process, when I'm having my needs analysis and I'm taking a client kind of uh, understanding their business and, and we've gone for 45 minutes and an hour of needs analysis and really getting into understanding their business. At the end, I will ask for that consensus. It sounds like an opportunity for us to work together. Could I put forward a proposal, for example? And once I've got that consensus, then I will ask for some small commitments. It might be the time for our next meeting, for example. Um, it could be getting additional data. Um, it might be allowing us to do site tours or speak to other staff within their business. There's multiple ways in which we can ask for these small commitments. And once made, again, this becomes a coming together for, for us and the decision maker. The likelihood of somebody making those small commitments who is undecided on you as a supplier or who's actually got a negative feeling towards you as a supplier is unlikely to happen. In fact, it's a great buying signal is to, to look at these small commitments and see what kind of commitment the client is making. Um, and excuse me if I use client and prospect interchangeably, because for me, all, all clients are also prospects because there's more business I could get from them. Um, and I treat all prospects like I would treat a great client um, and, and show them the love. So if you, you hear me using those interchangeably, that's why. Um, and so these small commitments become really important indicators. They're a buying signal from the client. If they're prepared to make those small commitments, then we're, we're moving on the path to making larger commitments. Um, I had an interesting case. I went to buy a, a used car and I found, I got asked for the question as, as we kind of had, had done a test drive and we'd been out, the, uh, the used car salesman got a form for me and he said, okay, well, what we do is when we sell a car, we'll donate $50 to a local charity. And on this piece of paper with, with three or four charities listed, and they hand me the pen and hand me the piece of paper and said, which would you like to choose? Tick the box and just sign it. Which I thought was a really interesting sales process or, or attempt to, what it was doing was getting me used to a couple of things. It was getting me used to having this, this pen in my hand and piece of paper and signing. It was also a small commitment. It was, it was a little step on the way to a bigger step as far as making commitment goes. There was a psychology to it. Um, and, and it was really leveraging what this used car dealership was doing. It was leveraging this idea of, of commitments and making these small commitments. Much easier to then make me step onto larger ones. But it works in several ways. It, it definitely works from a, a, a perspective of qualifying where you stand with the client. It also works in the sense of moving us forward and getting and showing us that we're both on the same page and moving forward. Um, so they're both really powerful tools, particularly consensus. I, I, I use it all the time. You can't double check and cross check enough. Um, and lastly in there, I, and I throw the three C's in together just because it works in trying to remember my six pillars of persuasion. And this is why I say there might be more than six. This kind of makes it eight or nine. Um, consistency is really important. And consistency, you could almost also name alignment. Um, for me, the, the importance in presenting or, or putting ourselves forward to people in a persuasive manner is to remain consistent. Um, and I think of this thematically. You know, if I thought about a company, I tend to hold the theme of our business. In the case of Valenta, for example, I, I might carry a theme through, which is your success is my success. I mean, really at Valenta, unless the client is succeeding, then we're, we're not succeeding. We want them to be reducing their overheads through, through outsourcing. We want them to be reducing their cost through you know, uh, robotic process automation and, and removing cost out of processes. 
um, it is only when that occurs that we're successful. So I'll, I'll maintain a theme of, you know, your success is my success and align that with everything that I present. It should align with, with physically how I present, my tone, my passion for the business, where I conversation should align to this goal of, of making them a more successful business. Um, and so consistency is really important. We don't want to emotionally be all over the road. We want to be really straight up and down. We know what our goals are, how and why we'd like to deliver that. And we want to consistently do that. We don't want to be jumping around as far as our approach or our belief system. We want to be very straight up and down. So consistency matters. And there's some, some lovely benefit in the repetition or maintenance of a theme as well, which is we learn through repetition. And so if we want to embed within our client base or within our prospect, um, our belief system and what our goals are, then we remain consistent to that thing. We remain consistent to that message. And we deliver it on an ongoing basis. Um, it's interesting in that I've spent a lot of time in the field with, with people who are client facing and that we can often have almost a, a, a 50 minute conversation without ever really coming back to look at things. If it's all just new information without any repetition or, or any theme underlying it, then often that can just be a large amount of information that somebody is looking to, to absorb or take in. And I think of it this way, if I was, if I was to, to grab that prospect six hours after you'd met them and say, well, tell me about that meeting, what, what kind of kept coming through for you, uh, they may find it quite difficult to remember specifics. Whereas if we consistently sting to a, a theme uh, and aligning that through our whole conversation, then you'll tend to find there's a lot more uh, retention of that information. Um, at the end of the day for the prospect. It will, it will embed itself much more deeply. So the three C's are, are fantastic in my opinion. I love them, particularly consensus. Um, consistency becomes about who you are, remain consistent and passionate and hold that belief system. Um, and use your consensus to, to then ask for additional commitments. It, it might be more information, the next step, the next meeting, some introductions, whatever that may be. Leverage the consensus into your next set of commitments. So the three C's are really powerful. All right, well, I think this kind of goes without saying. There's not much training you can do about getting somebody to like you. Um, but again, I think I'll come back to remind you about this being about persuasion. So this is about us having somebody move from one position to another, kind of emotionally, their belief system. They, they, we want somebody to move from believing that, that their current approach or current supplier is the best way to do things um, to move to our position, which is saying, I think we would be the best solution for you, the most optimal, either as a supplier or, or whatever the case may be. And so it's this idea of, of what is persuasive to us as human beings. And so obviously, if we like somebody, it becomes more persuasive. If I had a stranger walk up to me in the street and say, uh, Chris, you should see this, this new movie, The Dry. It's, it's a fantastic movie, you should see it. I'm like, oh, okay, but you're, you're a stranger to me. If I have a best friend I happen to be having a hit of golf with says, hey, Chris, you got to see that movie, The Dry, it's awesome. It has a different impact on me. The likelihood of me um, being persuaded to go and see The Dry or go and see the movie Du Jour is much stronger coming from somebody I like. That recommendation coming from, you know, uh, my mother versus the stranger are going to be two completely different reactions. So we can leverage this and like I said, it's, it's not really, uh, I can hardly tell you how to go about having people like you, but I think what I will say is there's some key strategies to that that you, that you should be implementing on a, on a regular basis. The, the, the number one thing or the number one mistake I, I see being made when it comes to liking is people lacking authenticity. It's really important that, that when we go about our role and, and we approach the market that we're very authentic. Um, you just need to be you. It's important that we, we try to eliminate, you know, a persona that we're putting on, that we try to become a salesperson, for example, or that, you know, I put the suit and tie on and, and, and suddenly I hold myself differently and I speak a little differently. It might be a little more serious, a, a, a little more purposeful. Uh, and I really encourage people to, to try and eliminate that, that feeling or that desire to 
put on airs or, or put on a persona when you go into a meeting with clients, but rather actually do the opposite, which is expose more of yourself emotionally. Um, be, be more real, you know, be as real as you can be. Um, because, you know, that's, that somebody's going to get that. And what, what we, we observe as human beings is um, we've got a great ability to spot falseness or, or, or to spot falsehoods in, in people's, even their persona. There are 43 muscles in the human face and our ability to pick up on facial cues and ticks and, and the like is, is really strong. And it may not occur on a conscious level, but it is definitely occurring on a subconscious level um, and very quickly. We, we do it in split seconds. And so often it might be the case that whilst we may not be able to pinpoint what it is that you know, we're feeling uncomfortable about, but you might refer to it kind of, I, I call it my spidey sense. You know, you just got a feeling about somebody um, that are just not, that they're, they're not quite fitting into their own skin as, as comfortably as they could. And it's probably appropriate to say, you know, it's almost like we're wearing an ill-fitting suit. Because often, that's often kind of literally what's occurring is people are putting on a suit or putting on a, a persona. Um, and it, however we envisage ourselves, whatever we see this role being of ours when we, when we go out to the market, will be reflected in our body language, in our tone, and in the, in the words that we choose. Remembering that a, a large percentage, percentage of communication is physical, it is body language, it is tone, much more so than the words we choose. So we want to make sure that we're very authentic in our, our goal of delivering the best result for the client. Um, I really love the idea of finding, you know, shared values, commonalities. Often when I talk about a connecting strategy in, in going out and prospecting and, and getting appointments, I talk about building connections, you know, have two or three great connections to somebody. And it can be as simple as geographic. It could be, you know, educational. It could be work history. It could be interests, football teams, whatever that may be. Try and build these connections so that we've got that common ground and that commonality. If you then combine that um, commonality and similar interests and shared values and, and history and whatever that may be with your authentic passion for the success of their business and, and you bring with you this authentic belief that their success is your success and that really your driving force is to optimize their business. But it's not about us and it's not about me, it's about them and an amazing result for them. Then if we talk about liking, it becomes very difficult to not like you. It's very hard not to like somebody that you have shared values with, um, that you've got similar interests with, and who is sitting really across a desk from you with an energy and a passion for your success. It's, it's very hard not to be attracted to somebody who, who holds that position. So it's really important that we don't kind of tamper our passions and our excitement about their success, that we don't kind of self-edit or censor ourselves in, in articulating our passion for their great outcomes. I, I, we want the client to hear that. We want a prospect to hear that, that it matters to you, that, you, that really your motivation and, and your goal is to have them succeed because through that success, you succeed. And when they hear that message and combine it with those other things, all of a sudden you become a much more attractive opportunity for somebody. You become you know, a person I want to deal with. You become a person I'm happy to see again. Make another meeting, of course. Why not? I enjoyed talking to you. You're very authentic. Um, I, I kind of would also think of it this way, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say this, but I really think it's important that somebody may or may not believe yet in your product, service or offering. They may not believe that yet that it, it is the best choice for them. But what I want them to believe is that you believe it. What matters is, is not as much whether they're sold yet, whether they're a yes yet, but what they should do and what they must believe is that you believe it that you're passionate about it, that you're very authentic in that belief. They may or may not go ahead with your business, but what they'll never forget or never let go of is the fact that, hey, we might not buy from him, but he believes it. And that really matters, yeah, that, that they're connecting with that passion that you have for your business. And so when I think about liking, I think about authenticity, body language, tone, keeping it light, keeping it, you know, um, really authentic. And, and this other side effect that occurs is when, when people are talking to salespeople or someone that's trying to grow their business, you're sitting in front of them, they automatically put up a, a, an emotional brick wall, an emotional barrier, which is to say they, they kind of don't want to be sold to, don't sell me something. We all do it. Um, I guarantee, you know, if you're on this call, you've, uh, 
you probably gone to a, 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 a mall or a shopping center. You've been looking for a shirt or a dress or a suit. You got a wedding coming up and you go into a shop, you go into a clothes shop and the, the, the retail assistant comes up to you and says, can I help you? Are you looking for something in particular? And you go, no, just look. A, you're a liar. B, this is a classic example of us just not wanting to be sold to it. Like just, I just want some space. I don't want you to sell to me. We don't, as, as people generally like being sold to, sit in a room full of 100 people and ask who likes to be sold to and you might get one or two hands up in that room. It, it's very rare. We don't like being sold to. And kind of by definition, when, when an appointment is made and, and a decision maker has you walk through the door to sit down in front of them, what they're expecting is to be sold to. So what we want to do is eliminate that because that, that idea of being sold to has them put that barrier up, that psychological barrier that says, oh, I just don't want to be sold to. So we're kind of ready to resist it. We're ready to, to deflect or, or definitely don't want any of this kind of sales trickery occurring on me. So we, we protect ourselves emotionally and psychology, you know, from a psychological perspective where we're saying kind of get off. But the more authentic we are, the more we use a bit of humor, um, and self-deprecation, what happens is it, it becomes much easier for me to drop that barrier because I'm like, oh, this person is genuinely interested in what's best for me. Uh, they're enjoying themselves. There's no show. And, and we start to reflect one another. So what happens is when I'm open and authentic and honest and real um, and building those connections, the person across the table starts to do the same. You know, we often talk in sales about mirroring the prospect. Well, in turn, what happens is they mirror you. You relax, you're enjoying the process, you're passionate about their success. And what happens is they will relax, drop that emotional barrier and be more likely to kind of hear the story and thus be persuaded. Um, so uh, on one hand, I, I kind of started this by saying, I, you know, how do I tell you how to you know, worry about being liked? But there's, there's a huge amount of benefit in doing so and, and taking it easy. I also, I'd recommend, you know, if you've ever been, you know, if you can remember back, I'm a bit of an older guy, but if you remember back to the dating scenes or if any of you are dating at the moment, it's a bit like dating in the sense that you don't want somebody who's talking all about themselves across the table from you. You want somebody who's interested in you. Um, if, we, if we look at often in our needs analysis stage of the process, I'll use a mantra, which is be interested, not interesting. Be interested, not interesting. Um, be fascinated by their business. Be, be fascinated by the prospect. You know, if, if I put that in dating terms, be fascinated by your date. Be interested in them instead of worrying about being interesting. Um, somebody who's going to sit and talk about themselves for 30 minutes at dinner and, and try to be impressive or interesting is probably going to end up not being very much of, of those things. Um, and so you'll be amazed that a client who you're fascinated by, who you spend all the time talking about them, suddenly thinks you're awesome. They like you a lot. Right? You just talked about them. All right? We were interested, not interesting. So that's another great way to kind of look at it or, or go in psychologically prepared for a conversation with a client is just going fascinated by them. Get rid of all our ideas about us and talking about us or how amazing our business is. Go in and talk about their business and how amazing it is and your passion for their business. And you'll be surprised at how attractive you become to, uh, to prospects and clients. All right, so that's liking. So it's important. Again, these are persuasive tools. So how do we persuade somebody? So, so far we've got reciprocity. I'm gonna do something for you without necessarily expecting an immediate return for it, which creates this psychological indebtedness. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm consistently asking for, for consensus and agreement consistently. So we, we're constantly doing the same things. We, we're thematic in it we consistently get consensus. And then at certain points, we'll ask for small commitments and this will show us and point us in the right direction. And it's persuasive for the client because it starts them on a journey of commitments. Yes, becomes another yes, becomes another yes. And we want people to be liking us. We wanna be authentic and genuine and, and have them be attracted to us as a fellow business partner in the world. The other thing we wanna do is leverage our authority. Um, as, as people, uh, we respond to authority. It's been studied, there was some, actually a really famous uh, experiment in the 60s done by uh, Stanley Milgram, which it, it couldn't be repeated today based on just a, a kind of ethics of uh, psychological testing. 
but I recommend you check it out. If you have a look at uh, Stanley Milgram's experiments from the 60s, you'll see it was very much based around authority and how, how we respond to authority as, as human beings. And I put a picture of the, the, the essential services up there because it's a great way to give an example. Or, or I might uh, give an example for how persuasive authority is. If, uh, if, if you had somebody knock on your door right now, a bang, bang, bang on the door, and you walk out to the door, you open the door, and there's just a, a person standing there, T-shirt, pair of shorts, and, and some flip-flops, thongs, as we call them in Australia. Um, and they said, get out of the house. Now, come with me. Go, we've got to go now. You would look at that person, you'd probably shut the door, look at them through the through the window and be prepared to call the cops or at least kind of talk to them from behind a screen door and get more information. If a person in a firefighter's uniform or a police uniform knocked on the door and said exactly the same words, we've got to get out now, you've got to come with me now, go, 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 likelihood is you start grabbing stuff, you start heading for the door going, you're, you're on the move and you're heading out the door as you're questioning what's happening how we respond to authority. It's very built into us as human beings to respond this way to authority um, and to pay attention to it. And, and we, we want to leverage this knowledge. It's really important that we leverage this knowledge in, in, in our meetings and as a persuasive tool because people will respond to authority almost automatically. So if I give you another example, most, most people on this call, I imagine, uh, are operating in kind of a B2B environment even better see this is the same situation, but let's imagine we're in a boardroom. So we've got a, we've got a, a, a big prospect, a big client, multi-million dollar client. Um, and, you know, we're going in for our first meeting and we've got a couple of people coming to the meeting. We've got the CEO and a CFO coming along and we're going to go talk to them about uh, uh, RPA, robotic process automation and outsourcing. And we walk in and we, we do our initial greetings. And stuff. Thank you very much. Shake hands, shake hands. And there's a handover. What occurs is the, is the client will now go, okay, Chris, you wanted to have a meeting with us about RPA and outsourcing, over to you. And what's happening in that handover is the person that was in charge of that room at that point, which is the CEO or the CEO and the CFO, are effectively saying, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hand authority or control over to you. It's your turn now to run the meeting. You asked for the time, we've given you the time now, over to you, what did you wanna see us about? And it's really important that we recognize that handover of, of control because what happens is that authority gets handed over. And our job now is to leverage the authority that A, we've been given, which is you're now in charge of the room, and the authority that we have as an expert in our field. So in the case of Valenta, I am an expert on contemporary use of outsourcing policies, contemporary approaches to robotic process automation and the other digital transformation, you know, uh, opportunities that we have. I'm the expert, you know, I know more about this than a CEO or the CFO do. Um, and so that, that gives me a position of authority. And what Milgram showed us is that once I have that position of authority, I can leverage that. So I can start to drive the program. So to come back to the start of that story, in that first five minutes, what I could do, and, and I think you would see this, this play out in real life, is I could say to those decision makers, Mary, Tom, I'd like you to stand up and just come out to reception with me for a minute. I'd like to show you something. And I'm, I, I guarantee Mary and Tom would stand up and follow me out of the room. Now, they're the CEO and CFO of you know, a multi-million dollar, $100 million, billion dollar business. But the reality is what happens is when that authority is handed over and that control is handed over, they relinquish that. They say, okay, I'm now following you. And they will do so until you give them a reason not to. In other words, unless you demonstrate you are no longer the authority, then they will continue to follow that. So you can go out, you can go out to reception, you show them you know, whatever you wanted to show them or tell the story or explain whatever, bring them back in and sit down and you start to drive this and start to, to I suppose, be a traffic controller and ask for commitments, ask for, for approaches, ask questions, really drive the process going forward. And if you do that with consensus and these small commitments, what happens is those decision makers will allow you to remain in control as long as you're doing a good job, as I said, and it adds value to them. And you'll know when you're not doing a good job because they'll let you know. Um, it, you may have been in meetings with people, not you will not have done this, of course, but maybe you've been in a meeting with somebody where this has occurred. 
where that handover occurred. Okay, over to you, Chris. And, and as a salesperson, rather than being interested instead of interesting, I start to talk and just tell them about my business. And I kind of, I, I, I vomit out all this information about my company and I start trying to sell them from the first minute. You know, here's how wonderful we are. We're a global business. Here's what we do. Here's how we help people. And I spend 20 minutes talking about myself. You'll recognize that decision maker taking control back because they'll start to drive it again. And I'll start to ask quick snappy questions like, well, what's your price? How long would it take? What do you do? Who are your competitors? And what's happening is they're taking that control back because what they're saying to you or the subtext is, I gave you the chance to run this show. I gave you the chance to control this meeting. And I don't think you did a very good job. So I'm going to take control back and I'm going to start driving again. So they start saying, okay, well, can you give me a proposal on that? And, and they're essentially trying to get you back out the door as quickly as they can. And, and if you've sat in enough meetings, you'll have watched this occur. Basically, we had a handover of control, but we didn't do a good job when we were in control. And so the decision maker takes that back. And what we can learn from Milgram through this authority is as long as we maintain it, we pay due respect to our audience. Yeah, they've given us this, this authority and this control. Let's make sure we don't abuse that. We make sure that we deliver a great result and, and we consult in a truly professional way that delivers value to the client. Then they'll allow us to do that. And that can help us drive the process through not only a needs analysis stage, but to getting a proposal, closing that and pushing through implementation and beyond. We, want to use, we really don't need to relinquish that control in, uh, at any point if it goes well. And it changes the dynamic in the relationship, but we've got to respect it. And, and we have to, A, be experts. So we must consistently build our knowledge, for example, of what is contemporary outsourcing, what is the best uh, approaches to RPA, what is you know the, the digital transformation of today and tomorrow, and be able to share that in an expert manner, because that is what gives us our authority um, so we need to make sure that we do that. The other thing that gives us authority or demonstrates it is our, our process, making sure that we've got a clear strategy for conducting a meeting, for example. Um, if, if, I, uh, if I went into my doctor, uh, my doctor's the expert, he's the authority. But if I sat down at the doctor and, and you know, they didn't take my blood pressure and started uh, writing me a prescription for something that didn't seem related, I'd be like, what the, like what's going on? I want to get out of there. But that's not what happens. When I go to the doctor, they've got a process. They're going to check my blood pressure, hop on the scales. How much do you drink, Chris? Do you smoke, Chris? We're going to go through uh, uh, our due diligence, our duty of care to do the right job as a professional person. It would be the same if I go to a doctor or an architect. If I go to the architect, they're not going to pull out a set of plans and tell me how I should be in this 20-story building. I'm going to go to the architect and they'll assess what my goals are, what my business is, what, what hopes and dreams I have for the building, You know, kind of what I want to achieve environmentally. There's going to be a duty of care or a process that every professional service goes through. And the level or the quality of that process will be an indicator or will, will have a subtext to it, which is, how much that decision maker can, can trust you or hand over this authority because you're proving your expertise through your process. We can't be a professional services or a consultant and go in and, and not have clear direction on where we're going, which is really important because we're going to let somebody drive if they're going to hand over authority for, for this kind of control of a meeting or control of the process, then they need to clearly understand that you know where you're going and where you're taking them. If they feel like they, they don't know where they're going or where you're taking them and you're not articulating that, that they don't understand the process and, and what the end result of this process will be, then again, they'll take that control back because we, we get very uncomfortable if we don't know where we're going. We get very uncomfortable if we feel like, you know, the person who is driving is out of control. Right? So we make sure they've got really clear direction, clear understanding where we're going and we're articulating that to the, um, to the prospect of the client is what you can expect from this meeting. What I'd like to do is get to understand your business a little bit better and be able to share with you some strategies that we've implemented with other clients. And, and I'll share with those with you as you go. And hopefully what I can do is impart some knowledge that, that you'll be able to implement yourself. Or, you know, if we get to this end of this meeting and we can see value in it, maybe even we can talk further about working together. So if I can, I'll ask you a question. So I kind of lay the groundwork out. I let somebody know where I'm going, what the plan is, and they can, kind of sit back and relax a little bit, knowing that that I've got it, we're under control, and we're going in a particular direction. This is where we're headed. 
So all of these things kind of form a part of this authority and control. Um, but it, it's a really powerful tool. What I found is over the years, the more I realized that I was in charge, rather than being sitting in meetings, feeling like I was a, kind of essentially the victim. I, I, I was in the laps of the gods, you know, either they took it this direction or they took it that direction. And what I realized is it wasn't up to the client, it was entirely up to me as to where I wanted to take that. And essentially, most of the time, the client is saying to you, here are the keys, it's your turn to drive for the next 45 minutes. Where you take it is up to you. And only if you screw it up will I take the keys back. And I think the more I connected with that as a, as a business person, as a salesperson, the better I've done in meetings because I do start to take control. Like, okay, I know this is my field of expertise. Yeah, I, I know what's going on. Let me help walk you through it or take you on that journey. And people are prepared to do that. They'll hand over that authority. So it's a great tool. And check out Milgram. It's kind of a fun, you'll be amazed. Watch the video on Milgram if you haven't seen it. I think you'll probably recognize it when you see the first five minutes of it. If you haven't seen it, be prepared to have your mind blown. All right. Uh, the next thing we want to do is make sure that we've got some social proof. Um, social proof is important in, I talk about four pillars of persuasion. Uh, four pillars, sorry, I talk about the four reasons people don't buy. Sorry, not four pillars of persuasion. Four reasons people don't buy. No trust, no need, no money, no hurry. No trust, no need, no money, no hurry. And so trust becomes really important. So what social proof does for us is really leverage or build up um, the trust for the client. So obviously, you know, the, the classic is celebrity endorsements. Celebrity endorsements, and, and these days we talk about influences on social, social media and the like, is it, is it is persuasive. I trust them, so I'm going to trust the brand, the brand that's associated. I gave the example before, you know, if my mother told me to go see the movie, I'd be like much more inclined to believe her and go and do it. I trust her. And so, uh, you know, this, this, this building up of trust is really important. We can do it through testimonials, through um, uh, case studies. We, we you know, it, they're really powerful ways that we can do it. Uh, Google has Google reviews. I know within our business, for example, we've got a whole program around promoting our Google reviews and getting five-star reviews because it works on building trust with clients. It, it, it's, it's known when people see a, a five-star Google review, it kind of matters to them. Um, apart from the whole SEO component of it, 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 uh, it builds trust. And trust is a, a vital component of getting a sale. People need, need to trust us. So the other way that I leverage this too is I, I consistently name drop whenever I can. If I'm in even my first meeting, oh, you've got that challenge. I found that uh, XYZ lawyers also had a similar challenge. Oh yeah, I don't know if you know Jim over at McCulloch Law, but he found that he was having a similar situation. Oh yeah, yeah, I once had Mary up at HT Law. They saw the same thing with their systems. I, I name drop wherever I can. Um, it's really important. The other thing that, that I will do, and I'll do that in meetings, I'll do it in proposals, I'll do it wherever I can, whenever I can. The other thing that I do is I don't talk about how good our service is. What I will refer to is what our clients enjoy about our service. I don't point to me and say, how good am I? What I do is I point to a client and I go, they love me. What they love about us is this. And that's really what Google reviews do. It's like, don't believe me. When I send out an email prospecting, I talk about our Google reviews. I'll cut and paste a Google review into the email. I don't say we're an amazing business. I go, these people think we're an amazing business. Don't believe me, believe them, right? Because we've got to imagine, uh, again, if you think, you know, uh, the, one of the least trusted uh, roles out there are salespeople. You know, we've kind of got it built into us not to trust salespeople. Okay, don't trust me, trust them. Trust these other people. Trust Michael Jordan for a pair of shoes, right? Trust these people that gave me testimonials. Have a look at this case study, read it. Don't trust me, trust them. And so right throughout... Uh, uh, any conversation I'll, I'll keep saying, yeah, Jim found that they really enjoyed it. At HT Law, what they enjoyed about our service was our ability to deliver quickly. What JB Law liked about our business was our ability to do X, Y, and Z. What they liked about us is this. And this is social proof. We know it's powerful. We've got influencers out there becoming millionaires. We, you know, don't believe me, believe them, right? Influencers out there on social media making gazillions through this idea of tr trusted brands, social proof. Um, so don't believe me, believe them is the key thing, right? And we know it to be very persuasive. All right, scarcity. Probably again, now the scarcity is um, 
one of my my favorite uh, human behaviors to leverage when it comes to um, persuasion and decision making. And the reason I've got some toilet paper there is because if you ever had to kind of assess what scarcity does to human beings, just look at the pandemic and, and how people dealt with toilet paper. We clean the shelves off. No logic to it. Right? Now, we'll talk about, uh, you know, one of my mantras is we buy on emotion, we justify with logic. We buy emotionally and then we justify that decision with the logic. Um, and, and all I can say is if you don't believe me, explain to me why toilet paper got cleaned off the shelves. And interestingly, I know in a bunch of countries with a pandemic, for example, they've gone through second waves. And so in the first wave, everyone cleaned off the toilet paper off the shelves. And we're all like, what is going on? You're all mad. Why is everyone taking the toilet paper? You're all mad. There's plenty of it. The manufacturers are like everybody. There's plenty of it. We've got heaps. You don't need to hoard it. You don't need to clean the shelves. We've got plenty. Six months later, a second wave of the pandemic comes through a country. And what happens? Toilet paper gets wiped off the shelf. Companies are like, we've got plenty. No, no logic behind it, no logical justification, purely an emotional decision, which just completely underscores that idea of us buying emotionally and we justify logically. You'll, you will have in, uh, in you know, uh, situations where um, you, you have oh, buying a house, for example. I mean, how many times you go, well, a big house, it's a very logical decision. No, it's not. Yeah, it's often still an emotional one. Why, what, where did I buy? Well, I bought a particular suburb. Your logic will be, well, it's close to the school we want to go to. Emotionally, it's because it positions you socially. Yeah, you've probably chosen a suburb based on social hierarchy and where it puts you and where it positions you psychologically, um, you know, uh, based on community, et cetera. But you'll follow up with logic. You'll walk into a house and, you, you know, I've walked into a house and my wife's like, I love it. And it's close to a school and the shops and whatever. Oh, I think that's awesome. And it's got good fuel economy and it's a good price. We buy emotionally and we justify logic. And so one of the strongest ones of these is scarcity. And so we need to ensure that we can explain to a prospect or to a client why they should act now. What are they going to miss out on if they don't act now? And it's probably one of the biggest missing elements of most salespeople and most businesses um, presentations or proposals. What they do is they put forward a fantastic proposal. We can reduce your processing costs. We can improve performance, make you more efficient. And the prospect comes back and goes, look, that all sounds fantastic. I agree. We have consensus. We could improve that. Just not right now. It's just not a priority. Right. What they're saying is that all sounds very good. You just haven't given me a reason to do it now. I've got four or five other projects that seem urgent to me. Yours does not seem urgent. What we've done is we've not connected any fear of missing out. And, and in truth, often the case is that we present solutions that are unchanged six months later. If I came back to you, for example, if, if you think about it this way, if you had an offering and the customer comes back to you three months later and that offering remains the same, then the customer's right in delaying. You gave them no reason to act now. Have a think about any time you're putting forward a proposal or an offering is to go, what do they miss out on if they don't do it today? What's the loss that they suffer if they don't do it today? What do they miss out on? Because that's the trigger. What we want to do is, is trigger that emotion. Because that emotion around scarcity is one of the strongest human behaviours we have. It's very... DNA level. And like I said, th think no further than toilet paper if you doubt me. In my business, I have a wholesale herb and spice business. I can use availability as scarcity. It's literally scarcity of availability. There's been some floods, there's limited supply, get it now or you will miss out. And I, and I use that as a, as a very strong level within my own business. Um, so make sure whatever you're doing, you're, you're including scarcity or limitations on supply in some way, shape or form as a part of your offering to make sure that you trigger that, that emotion within the buyer. If you were selling a house, for example, uh, oh, I, I like the house, I think we'll have a look at it. What's the real estate agent gonna say? Get in quick, we've got a couple of offers on the table or we've got a few people looking through it. What are they doing? Creating scarcity. In financial year sale, what am I doing? Creating scarcity, scarcity of time 
all of these things are here to trigger that emotion in you. Um, so make sure that you're doing the same. All right. And I think that is our, uh, our, our six pillars of persuasion. So thank you um, to everybody who's been able to join. Thank you, Jace, for, for having me. Do we have any questions from anybody? Oh, I can't hear you, mate. I got you muted. How about uh, Chris? Th thanks very much. We do have one question from uh, Vikas. Yeah, it's, please. How do you colorate philosophy of buying emotionally and justified logically for Valenta services? Oh, yeah, I think um, it's interesting because often the more technical we get, we think it's, it remains a very logical decision. But ultimately what's happening is for a decision maker, they've got a commercial need and they've got a human need. The, the commercial need is our logic. The commercial need is what are they looking to fix, avoid or accomplish? So I just, just always remember commercially, we're looking to fix a problem that exists, something's broken. We're looking to avoid risk or we're looking to accomplish an outcome, which might be cost reduction. So in the case of um, Valenta, we might have a situation where we go, okay, well, they've, they've had a re revenue reduction because of the pandemic. Maybe they're in the tourist industry. So there's some logic there, right? And we, we're gonna talk about RPA process automation or some outsourcing of some roles. And we go, okay, they're doing that. But if you think about a human being, why does that person do that? I mean, they don't, you know, I get on, I put my pants on every day and my shirt and I go to work. Why am I doing that? Do I do it because at the end of the week when my paycheck comes in, I roll around in a bed of money? No, what I do is I'm doing it to achieve the goals in my life. I might be doing it to become a better CEO, to grow my family, to expand myself. So really our commercial need is ever, only ever delivering on a, on a personal need. So what I want to do is understand the goals and challenges of that decision maker. How does that impact that person? Because they may have a commercial challenge, which has a, a logical justification to it. But ultimately, it's still just serving a person, the, the purpose of fulfilling a human need, which is me as a, as a person, as a CEO, I want my team to be happy with me. I want my team to respect me. Um, I want to deliver results and, and I want to be the best CEO I can be. So I want the recognition of my peers. So often you will find that the goals that people have in delivering on the commercial outcomes are still there to deliver on a personal need, an emotional need. I want to be recognized within the business of having done a great result. If you think about the fear for people in change, the fear for somebody in a business that Valenta is talking to, for example, um, they might be able to see the, the justification for change in thinking, well, yeah, we definitely would save money if we did that or we change that process. But they've got an emotional fear, which is if I change and it stuffs up, what does that mean to me? And so we're still really selling to that idea of overcoming the fear of change. We're overcoming that emotion of fear. Or we're building on that idea of look at what you've accomplished. Imagine if you can deliver a 20% saving and reduce processing costs by this and improve the performance of your customer base and win new clients. What's happening is I have an emotional response to that. And then I justify it with the logic. So I think it, it, even with things like food, it's, people are like, yeah, but what about just buying fruit and vegetables? Well, I guarantee you buy from a particular organization for it. Which supermarket do you go to? It's not random. I guarantee somebody that wants to help the environment's buying organic. Their first decision is the emotional one. What does it fulfill in me? And then it becomes about the price, location, whatever the case may be. So even simple things like clothes are fulfilling an emotional need. How does it make me feel? How does it make me present to the community? And then I, I buy the clothes. I'm not doing it on a very practical basis, followed by the emotion. The emotion comes first and then the justification. Um, the other way to look at that, or I, I describe that, is goals drive behaviour. You know, if I... Uh, uh, I don't join a gym and then six months later go, you know what, I might try and lose some weight. The goal is first. What I want to do is lose some weight and then I follow that up by joining the gym and, and doing some exercise. The emotion comes first, the, the logic and the justification, the action comes second. Goal first, emotion first, action and logic second. And so we just want to make sure that we're always kind of connecting with that person on a level that says, why are you looking to achieve it? How do you feel about it? What does it do for you? I think one of the, the, the biggest questions that gets missed for people is how does a client feel about it? You know, you've got a process, you've got a technology, you've got some digital transformation occurring. That's fine, but how do you feel about it? Because the better I understand how they feel about it or how that challenges, the better I am to then solve that problem for them. If I solve that emotional 
issue for them, then the stronger reaction they'll have to. Great, uh, Chris. Thanks very much for that. And uh, I hope that clarifies your question as well there, Rick. And uh, with that, Chris, we don't have any further questions, but no, look, I'm saying there was a lot of content in there, um, you know, fantastic stuff about, uh, you know, scarcity, authority, and so on as well. Um, yeah, so thank you again for your time. And uh, thank you, everybody. Speak soon. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>